webinar uh, on mute swans in uh, this this uh, presentation of the Ohio Fish and Wildlife presentation series brought to you by the Ohio Fish and Wildlife Management Association, the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative, and the Ohio Chapter of the Wildlife Society. My name is Ken Duran, and I'll be hosting the webinar today. Uh, just a few housekeeping things. If you have any questions or are having difficulties, please type those into the chat bar. Um, if it is a question about the presentation, uh, we are going to be holding those to the end, but please feel free to type them, and then I'll read them off um, to our presenter at the end of the presentation today. So uh, as, as you have questions, please type them in. Um, I'd also like to uh, let people know that if you are interested in seeing any of our past webinars, um, you can go to obcinet.org and you can see all of our past recordings of uh, previous webinars. And then after today's webinar, uh, we will post the recording uh, there as well. Um, you can also view any upcoming uh, webinars that we will be having and then sign up for our, our, our email list to be alerted any time we we're going to be doing a new webinar. Uh, typically, we do these webinars every other month, but uh, we're not going to be having one in February because of the Ohio Fish and Wildlife Management Association's annual conference. Uh, this year's theme is Technology and Fish and Wildlife Management, and it will be held on February 6, 2015 at the Ohio State University's Fawcett Center. Uh, please go and register at the uh, link on your page on the screen right now. Now let's move on to today's uh, presentation on mute swans. Jordan Linnell is going to be talking to us today. Jordan works for the USDA Wildlife Services as a wildlife specialist trapping Arctic foxes in, on an uninhabited island in Alaska during the summers of 2010 and 2011. He also worked for the USDA Wildlife Services in Washington State as a beaver trapper in 2011. He's worked on numerous research projects including coyote and kit fox interactions in the West Desert, Water bird, winter water bird ecology in the Great Salt Lake, and measuring vital rates of populations of greater sage grouse. While attending Utah State University, he was president of the Berryman Institute, which focused on improving human-wildlife relationships and resolving human-wildlife conflicts through teaching, research, and extension. Upon graduating from Utah State University with the Bachelor's of Science in 2013, he began working for wildlife services here in Ohio where he is the lead on the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative's Mute Swan Project. His other duties involve managing wildlife on airports and assisting with rabies and feral swine work. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jordan, and thank you for uh, presenting today. All right, thanks, Ken. hope everybody can see this all right. Let's see. Sorry, one sec. Is there a way to minimize the screen on the right side? Uh, the red arrow button. Okay. Oh, thanks. All right. So I work for USDA Wildlife Services. We're actually a federal agency providing leadership in minimizing human-wildlife conflicts, and we do this through research, technical assistance, and applied management. So today, uh, talking about mute swans, uh, the reason why we're doing this is because uh, we're trying to protect natural resources, threatening and endangered species, and public health and safety. So here in Ohio, we actually have three types of swans. We have the trumpeter swan and mute swan, which are typically around this area for uh, throughout the year. And then we have the tundra swan, which is just migrating through. So the Division of Wildlife began the Trumpeter Swan Reintroduction uh, Program in 1996, and this plan called for 150 trumpeter swans to be released in selected wetlands, and were, they were hoping that uh, we'll reach the goal of at least 15 breeding pairs by 2006. In 2005, the goal was achieved. However, we did not have a restoration goal in place, and it's still currently listed as a threatened species. The future goal is to have a range of at least 15 counties with 40 uh, breeding pairs for three continuous years. We're currently in the second year of having at least 40 breeding pairs in the area, or in the state. So the trumpeter swans, they're native to Ohio, and as mentioned earlier, they're currently listed as a threatened species. 
and currently mute swans are uh, a threat to their breeding success. So mute swans. They're a non-native species and they're actually one of the largest waterfowl in the world. Uh, they weigh up to 30 pounds and actually the largest one discovered was actually 52 pounds, but uh, we don't think that that one could actually fly. And they actually have a long lifespan of up to 30 years and can produce up to 450 offspring in just 10 years using exponential growth. So this is their offspring having offspring and that offspring also having offspring. So it's not just two swans producing 450 offspring. So mute swans, they're actually native to Eurasia and were introduced into North America in uh, the late 1800s as ornamental waterfowl. And the feral populations began to establish in the 1900s. Oh, and also, the current population in Eurasia is estimated at about 1 million new swans throughout that area. So from a regional sc uh, scope, uh, we had personnel from Ohio Division of Wildlife and USDA Wildlife Services from all over the Great Lakes region attend the Great Lakes Mute Swan Summit to discuss the threat to the Great Lakes region and to identify strategies to manage uh, these mute swans on a regional scale. Uh, as part of the Great Lakes Task Force, we tried managing, coordinating management activities and try to uh, share info, info on their movements, how many there are, uh, what they're doing, and what kind of management activities uh, they've been doing in other states at the regional level. So the Mississippi Flyway Policy. This is actually a policy throughout the entire flyway, and uh, the mission is to maintain mute swan populations in the Mississippi Flyway at levels that will minimize or eliminate their harmful ecological impacts of native waterfowl species and habitat. And the goal is to actually reduce flyway populations to less than 4,000 total mute swans by 2030. And the reason why we're trying to go for less than 4,000 total instead of just a zero is because realistically we're anticipating that there's going to be some opposition in private, on private lands and waters where people do not want any mute swans removed. So in these areas, this will be the less than 4,000 total mute swans that are remaining in the flyway. So right now, uh, Michigan is actually uh, the source population for the area in North America. Uh, their estimated population uh, was 15,000 last year. But I talked to the biologists out there, and right now they're estimating that there's probably about 9,000 new swans. Uh, new York's population has been growing uh, quite dramatically. They tried conducting management activities last year, uh, but they were actually sued, and uh, their program was shut down. The new swan management program was shut down, so uh, their population is currently skyrocketing. This is actually a map from eBird. Uh, this is actually all the mute swan sightings throughout the area. And as you can see, Michigan has a really, really high population, as well as uh, New England area. So the current status in Ohio. Ohio law establishes that uh, mute swans are defined as a migratory bird. And they're currently a non-game species, so uh, they're not allowed to be hunted. However, if you have mute swans on your property and you would like them removed, you can contact the Division of Wildlife and uh, obtain a permit to remove them on your property or uh, give USDA Wildlife Services a call and we can uh, try and give you technical assistance on how to keep them out of, out of your area or if we can come out and conduct management activities ourselves. Right now, we have an invasive uh, non-native free-ranging terrestrial vertebrate policy, which is Division of Wildlife Policy 41. And through this, uh, we are actually trying, the Division of Wildlife is actually trying to uh, encourage wildlife managers to get rid of all the native, all uh, exotic species on their management, management areas. So from a regional scope, in 2013, USDA Wildlife Services received Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding to control invasive mute swans in Ohio. This great GLRI funding is the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative money from the Environmental Protection Agency to try and restore the Great Lakes area, the environment, to what it was historically. And in 2013, uh, USDA Wildlife Services began conducting surveys 
And through these surveys, uh, we've realized that there was actually a drastic increase in the number of mu swans in Ohio compared to what we originally thought there were. Originally, in uh, the Western Lake Erie area, in between Erie and Ottawa County, uh, it was estimated that, that there were the 53 mu swans there. However, through our surveys, we realized that there was much, much more than that. All right, state management goals. Our first goal was to participate in regional partnerships and work towards regional goals. This included uh, establishing the SWAN Task Force and the Mississippi Flyway Policy Council. Uh, our second goal was to implement Policy 41, as mentioned earlier, to try and get rid of all invasive species and dispatch a free ranging trust over to birds on Ohio Division of Wildlife land. Ohio Division of Wildlife would also like to encourage other land managing agencies to eliminate these species from their land. Three, implement the Ohio Swan Management Plan with the goals to minimize the impacts to Ohio's native wildlife, important habitats, and local economies, minimize conflicts with humans, and conduct public outreach and education. We'd also like to conduct population monitoring and research and feral population management and resource protection with the end result of having zero mute swans on public lands and zero population growth on all other lands by 2020. So uh, USDA Wildlife Services and Division of Wildlife have been working closely together to establish outreach material and trying to inform the public about new swans and the impacts that they're having, as well as trying to inform the public that there's three types of swans that can be found in the area and uh, establish that the new swans actually have detrimental impacts on the native environment. This is some of the outreach material. And you can try and contact John Window after this if you'd like to receive more uh, information and outreach material regarding mute swans. So uh, in October, well, Ohio Wildlife Services began conducting surveys in May of 2013. Prior to this, uh, as mentioned earlier, the estimated population was 53 total. However, during our surveys, our first survey, in May, uh, Ohio Wildlife Services counted 134 mute swans in the area in Ottawa County. And in October, we counted over 180 mute swans in, between the two counties. Uh, this, is act, this survey is actually uh, a Christmas bird count survey that was conducted in Ohio uh, from 1992 to 2013. And this survey is statewide, not just Western Lake Erie. But as you can see, the population has been growing uh, quite dramatically. In November 13th of 2013, we actually counted over 250 mute swans. Uh, most of this was actually over uh, by Catawba Island, right around this area, the western part of uh, West Harbor. So why are mute swans a problem? They're a problem for three reasons. The first is that they endanger native wildlife, then they destroy wetland habitat, and threaten humans. So mute swans are very, very aggressive. Uh, they're primarily uh, most aggressive during the spring and summertime when they're nesting and raising their young. And they'll often drive out native waterfowl and other wetland birds from the area, and have also been known to actually kill uh, other swans, ducks, and other waterfowl and shorebirds. And this also may be worse since uh, much of the wetland habitat has been reduced due to development. And, uh, it's also very important that we do everything we can to encourage trumpet or swan breeding success. This is actually a picture of a mute swan chasing away a canvas back. This is actually a picture that I took over in Erie County in a wetland area with the mute swan actually following around two trumpeter swans and driving them out of the pond. Here's a picture of a mute swan with two speckle belly geese. And notice a gosling circled in the right corner. All right, luckily, in this picture, uh, right after this picture was taken, the new swan had actually dropped the gosling, and the gosling actually survived. However, usually that's not the case. 
So mute swans uh, can actually de uh, uproot up to 20 pounds of submerged aquatic vegetation per day and consume only 8 pounds of it. Now, uh, submerged aquatic vegetation provides food and cover for fish and wildlife as well as decreases algal blooms and sediment runoff, therefore increasing water quality and providing food and habitat for many other native species, including our state-threatened trumpeter swan. Mute swans are not very afraid of people at all. Um, I've actually received numerous reports of mute swans attacking kayakers, jet skiers, and boaters, as well as people on land. And they actually have spurs on their elbow uh, that do hurt if you get whacked by them. And they supposedly that they have enough power to break a person's leg. And as a mute swan population grows, so is the number of water recreationalists. And the, the conflict will also grow accordingly. And they also have a six to eight foot wingspan. And uh, they can generate a lot of power. So in Illinois, um, there was a kayaker who was kayaking out by his condo complex. And the mute swan had actually uh, charged him, knocked him out of his kayak. And as he was trying to swim to shore, the mute swan was beating on him until he actually drowned. Now the wife of that guy is now suing the condo complex for having mute swans in their pond and not doing anything about it. So they are actually a huge liability too. So what can we do about this? There's two types of swan management uh, that are widely used. There's nest destruction and egg addling, and then the removal of subadult and adult swans. So nest destruction and egg addling is usually the most uh, socially accepted uh, type of swan control that there is. It's kind of practical, but it's very widely used, and uh, most people are fine with people with us using that. However, this requires that 72% of the nests are actually destroyed annually. And this does not address competition, impact on the submerged aquatic vegetation, or the threat to humans, though, when you're only uh, removing the eggs. Uh, our other management control is uh, lethal, lethal removal. And this actually has the strongest effect on the growth rate, and you're getting the most bang for your buck. It requires only a fourth of the person days as a uh, nest destruction egg removal would. And since it's so much shorter, um, it's a lot more cost effective and requires that only 17% of the swans are removed to see a decline. And also, by removing these problem swans, uh, you're, removing, you're removing the competition uh, between them and native wildlife, as well as uh, preserving the integrity of the marshes, because they're no longer able to destroy the submerged aquatic vegetation. And you're also reducing the threat to humans. So this is actually a model uh, by Michigan Wildlife Services. And it shows that you could either uh, remove 1,340 adult mute swan, adult and sub-adult mute swans in order to stabilize a population of about 8,000 mute swans. Or you can try and remove 18,700 eggs. And please note that it, it can be really tough to try and find all the nests in the area. So uh, many cities have actually asked us uh, what would be the best way to do this if they were if they were to commit to try and uh, conduct new swan management. And there's two approaches you can do. You can do an aggressive approach or a prolonged approach. With the aggressive five-year plan, by removing 32.5% uh, or by reducing survivorship by 32.5%, you're actually reducing the growth rate to uh, point, negative 0.183. And you'd only be removing 210 mute swans in order to eradicate, uh, or in, if you, sorry, starting out with a population, population of 200 mute swans uh, and trying to eradicate them. By doing it in five years, you'd only be removing 210 mute swans. If you take the prolonged approach and uh, want to remove all 200 mute swans in a 20-year plan, you'd actually be removing 373 mute swans uh, in the end. And you need to keep in mind that swans that you're not removing each year, uh, they're giving birth to more swans, and those swans are also giving birth to more swans. So uh, by, do, by, doing, uh, by taking the aggressive approach and removing them right off the bat, uh, 
you're actually killing much less swans, swans in the long run. So increasing the time frame actually increases the overall number of individuals targeted. Nearly 80% more swans are killed when using the 20-year plan versus the 5-year plan. And uh, if you ask the public how many they, if you could, if there was an opportunity to minimize the number of new swans total uh, to remove, that would actually be more socially acceptable than taking a longer, uh, prolonged approach and removing about 80% more swans than you'd have to. And it's also much more cost effective trying to remove them using the aggressive approach. All right, this is actually a model by uh, Michigan Wildlife Services. And you can see that prior to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding, they were removing a decent amount of mute swans. However, after receiving this funding, uh, their management was actually able to increase dramatically, and they were able to actually more than double their numbers. This is also an exponential growth curve from Michigan. And as you can see, uh, the population was increasing quite dramatically. And this is actually right where the GLRI funding began. And uh, as you can see here, look how many they were removing in 2011 and 2012. After removing uh, that high in numbers in 2011, 2012, their population only began to stabilize, didn't even begin to decrease yet. However, in 2014, uh, their population finally dropped down quite a bit. So right now, the barriers uh, that are hindering mute swan management is that uh, the public views them as a beautiful bird, which they really are. However, if they look more like Asian carp or feral swine or other invasive species like that, uh, people tend to not complain quite as much or have as much opposition to removing them. Uh, another problem that we have is that people are not seeing the impact that new swans have on the environment because uh, when they're eating the submerged aquatic vegetation, people can't see that. There's also been a strong lack of, no there's also been a very significant amount of lack of knowledge between states. Um, trying to figure out where they are, where they're moving, how many there are, and what management's taking place in those other states. And our other problem that we mentioned, mentioned earlier is that many people want to try and remove the swans just a little bit at a time. However, uh, this is not very effective at all. So the way forward, uh, we'd like to try and uh, conduct more public outreach and education, continue to disseminate more outreach material. Uh, we'd also like to maintain an updated management plan because by having an updated management plan, we're using the best science available to conduct management. And we also need to maintain uh, persistence when we're uh, conducting management. Another uh, big thing that we're trying to do is try to build relationships with various Audubon societies, and, uh, Ducks Unlimited, and other wildlife management, wildlife management agencies. As you can see in this picture, this is actually a letter showing support across constituencies. And it's a letter to Fish and Wildlife Services uh, showing their support uh, for swan management. And signed, and this is the American Bird Conservancy, uh, Auto, various Audubon societies, Ducks Unlimited, Environmental Defense, and uh, Wildlife Management Institute, and many other uh, stakeholders. So uh, any way you can to try and sh show your support for swan management would be really appreciated. Questions? All right, thank you, Jordan. Uh, so now if anybody has questions, feel free to ask. Um, we also uh, have John Windau on the line, too. So um, if you have any specifically about the Division of Wildlife, we can have John help answer those questions as well. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to just type them in the chat box. Uh, on in I did have uh, one question prior to the webinar, and that was wondering, somebody was wondering if um, anybody can shoot uh, mute swans and if there is a season on them.
uh, currently there's not a season on them, and the reason for that is because uh, we've actually had problems with people misident misidentifying waterfowl and shooting. Well, one person thought that they were shooting at snow geese and actually shot trumpeter swans, and the mew swans and trumpeter swans look very similar, and we're afraid that trumpeter swans might ac accidentally get shot in the process. So no, currently there is no, spe no season on them. And they're close to hunting, however you can obtain a permit from the Division of Wildlife to remove them if they're causing any damage or if they're on your property. But we do encourage that you report any new swan sightings to the Division of Wildlife or USDA Wildlife Services. Uh, one person asked, did they hear that correctly, that one pair of mute swans can produce 450 cygnets in 10 years? Uh, yes, through exponential growth, they can actually uh, produce 450 offspring. However, well, when we say that, uh, they may give birth to uh, five or six uh, cygnets or baby mute swans, and then uh, a few years down the road, those ones will also give birth, and then their offspring is also going to give birth. So you got to think about it exponentially. But it's not just those two individual birds that are producing 450 direct offspring. Uh, do you know the total population of mute swans in Ohio? Uh, currently, we have not seen any in Erie and Ottawa County uh, this month, actually. We've seen a great deal of trumpeter swans and uh, tundra swans, but we are not we are not sure usually we'll do a christmas bird count at the end of december okay uh, another question is what efforts are being made in other areas of the state other efforts as uh, they expand on that or for uh for controlling mute swans and maybe that's a question that john can help answer yeah go ahead john uh yeah um you know the main focus has been in the lake Erie marsh uh region uh which is where we're, most of our trumpeter swan restoration effort is. However, um, I know uh, over in the northeastern part of the state, uh, there's a big focus um, on the uh, the nest destruction and addling um, to try to uh, help control the population there. Um, we don't have huge mute swan populations in other parts of the state um, underway, uh, but I think they're working on um, trying to get some things in place uh, so when they do show up, uh, we can, you know, uh, reduce the, you know, eliminate the problem. Thanks, John. Are there any other questions? Um, so I'm, I got a question from John Heidi, and I'm, I'm not really sure what it, uh, you're asking here, but what advantage is there to trumpet or swans to mute swans? Uh, they're actually a native species. Um, we're trying to protect them. Uh, we don't want any species to go extinct at all. And they've actually been struggling uh, quite a bit recently up until we began doing mu swan control. But uh, And they have been struggling. Is that because of the competition with mute swans? Yeah, a great deal. Of, well, originally a lot of it was because they were actually uh, overhunted back in the late 1800s. But... Uh, when we've been trying to recover their, recover them back to historical numbers again, the mute swans have actually been out competing them, and mute swans will actually uh, nest about three weeks earlier than the trumpeter swans, and actually push them out of the area before they have a chance to breed. Do trumpeters destroy wetlands as much as uh, mutes do? No, because they're not as gregarious. Mute swans will actually, they only have home ranges of about, or territories about 3 to 15 acres in size typically. But uh, they'll, they'll actually congregate year-round and uh, destroy well inhabited wetland marsh. Like earlier in the survey, there was 250, over 250 mute swans in one concentrated area. If they're spread out with only one or two of them, they typically don't, uh, don't have the same kind of impact on the environment. Also, they're not nearly as, they're not very aggressive like mute swans are. Mute swans are the most aggressive swan there is. Uh, is there any program to relocate mute swans to people who might want them? Uh, no, there isn't at, at the moment. Uh, we are actually trying to get, keep them all off of uh, public lands because, uh, well, they're very aggressive. Even if they're 
and how do you keep them in just that one area? Uh, if people take them, they'll probably they'll have to get the wings clipped so that they can't uh, fly away and establish new feral populations. But, uh, so, so as a follow up, is there are there regulations um, against keeping mute swans? Uh, currently, no. You are allowed to, uh, to keep a mute swan. However, uh, we're trying to encourage people that to get the wings clipped so that they can't establish new populations in other areas. But and to keep them on in your pond and not let them escape to go anywhere. Are there any regulations on um, making sure that they can't breed too? Uh, currently, no. Okay. There isn't any set. We strongly discourage people to keep them because it's kind of hard to keep track of them, uh, of their cygnets once they give birth. Uh, the cygnets will still migrate away even without the adults. So. Well, that's all the questions I have unless somebody else has one real quick. Okay, well, thank you, Jordan. Uh, it was a very informative webinar. I appreciate you uh, taking your time today and uh, talking to us about mute swans. Yeah, thank you. All right. And thank you, everybody, for logging on and watching the, today's webinar. Bye, everybody.